pleasure to present to you Dr. Nia Kleiman, who is the director of our cardiac catheterization laboratory and interventional program. Um, he's professor of medicine at Well Cornell and our Institute of Academic Medicine, and he'll talk about antiplatelet drugs for how long? Only after stents? Neil, great to have you. Thanks, Bill. And I've got to say, Dr. Zogby's got a double A tough job. Number one, he uh, has a big department to run, keep on course. And number two, his other job is when I'm presenting, he's got to make sure I behave, uh, which is truly a challenge. So, um, Like this? Oh. Okay, so listen, let, let's, uh, let's do the easy part first. After stents only? No, not after stents only. The data are very, very clear now. From the CURE trial, clopidogrel plus aspirin versus aspirin alone for an acute coronary syndrome, at least 15 months, you need clopidogrel, period. The PLATO trial, clopidogrel versus ticagrelor in patients with an ACS, well, guess what? Ticagrelor is better. The Pegasus trial, patients within three years after an MI who are stables. Uh, I'm sorry, patients who are between one and three years after an MI who are clinically stable. Benefit is present, very clear, for a low-dose ticagrelor. So that's the easy part. But I'm going to talk mostly about stents because that's what I do. So in stenting, how long do you have to treat patients? Well, everyone knows the answer. It's a really silly question. The only problem is no one agrees on the answer. So last time I looked, which was last year, there were 12 randomized control trials. There were 45 meta-analyses. That's four meta-analyses per trial on short versus long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. Now think about what that means. That means nobody's got a clue. They weren't all concordant, they didn't agree. In fact, they weren't even close on agreement. So I haven't looked this year because I said to myself, well, if there are 45 meta-analyses in the last two years, what's the likelihood that number 46 is gonna clarify the issue? Okay, well, I won't answer that. And it gets worse. So this is Michelle Donahue from, uh, from Harvard. This is last year, two years after the DAPT trial. We're still debating. And then I was putting the talk together. I get a ding, got an email. And take a look. Dear Neil Kleiman, we present to you, I'm completely confused. How long do we keep plate patients on antiplatelet agents? Then it ends with best regards. Well, I had a two-word response. Dr. Zogby won't let me say it, but... You can imagine my reaction. So look, let's clarify things. 2017, what do we mean by antiplatelet therapy? P2Y12 antagonists, clopidogrel, and more recently, prazogrel or effiant, or ticagrelor. Most term, most studies are relatively short-term treatment. Prazogrel, 15 months in patients undergoing stenting for ACS, ticagrelor, nine-month follow-up. Well, why is that? Well, number one, the manufacturers have a timetable. If they do really long-term trials, they cannot get the drugs to approval, and there's a lot at stake. And remember, these are publicly held companies, so there's some social responsibility to that. Number two, when the subjects start to outlive the investigators, it gets really embarrassing. <laughs> the downside is bleeding risk. Aspirin, you've heard of that drug. It's been around for about 110 years. 2017, there's no way around it in patients with coronary artery disease. But of course, being a generic drug and really cheap, it has no friends, it has no proponents, no one to stand up for it. So of course, when people bleed, we always blame the aspirin because it's defenseless. And there are trials now evaluating whether we should use P2Y12 antagonists without aspirin. PAR1, who knows what PAR1 is? Well, it's a really hot receptor on the human platelet. This was the 
If you're in the basic or translational world, there's been a tremendous amount of attention to this receptor for a variety of reasons. It's really neat stuff if you read about it. This is the primary thrombin receptor on the human platelet. And I've, I've long been a proponent of developing drugs that target this receptor. I'm not smart enough to do it, but I was really excited about it. That said, Vorapaxar uh, is currently available. It's a drug that targets PAR1, but you know the trials have been so equivocal or negative that even though I've been really hot about this stuff, I have never once prescribed it. Although there's one patient in whom I did think about using it. Okay, so just remember, the downside is these drugs make you bleed. This came out in the Lancet this week. Take a look. There's an inflection point for bleeding risk. Now, obviously, the older you are, the more frail you get, the more likely you are to bleed. Uh, it looks like there's an inflection point at about age 75. So first two dots, relatively linear. Then you hit about 75. The risk of bleeding goes up. And take a look on your right the severity of the bleeding increases. So keep that in mind. The older and frailer you get, the more the balance changes. OK, so what about stents today? Let's stick to some really basic things. 95% uh, or more of the coronary stents we implant are drug-eluting stents. And Alpesh, forgive me for saying this, they consist of a metal frame, which is the scaffold, which holds the vessel open, a polymer that controls the release of drug and the drug. And now all the uh, drug eluting stents we use use serolimus analogs that interfere with the cell cycle, prevent the replication of vascular cells that would otherwise, re otherwise lead to restenosis. Of course, they also prevent the replication of endothelial and endothelial like cells that protect the stent. So it's a two edged sword. Oh, so I've been pressing the wrong button. Sorry, guys. Um, I don't do that in the cath lab. Uh, so let me, let me tell you why we care about this and why it's a topic of debate. So a little bit of a trip back into history. So 16 years ago, a guy named Suzuki published this study in circulation, got a lot of attention. Serolimus eluding stents in pigs and dogs. And the pigs and dogs did great. Shown on the top, bare metal stents. So take a look at those dark things. Those are stent struts. The purple stuff, cells grown in around them. Clinically, we call that restenosis. It's a real pain in the neck. Instant restenosis, you know, clinically isn't so bad, except it produces recurrent symptoms, and it's been tough to deal with. Down on the bottom, drug serolimus eluding stents. Take a look. Dark stuff for stent struts, the light purple stuff, cells growing in, and take a look. There aren't very many cells. You see a nice, big lumen. But you see a thin layer of cells on top of the struts protecting the struts from blood flow, which leads to clotting of the stent. OK, I'll put it, set it on stun. OK, so that was great. We were in hog heaven, and then one of these early trials comes back from Switzerland, the basket late study. And lo and behold, although these guys did a good job putting the stents in, take a look. They were on dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin and clopidogrel. Clopidogrel gets stopped. And what happens? The stents start to clot. Not a lot of them, and they didn't start to clot the day you stopped the clopidogrel. But once you were off it, you were at risk. And how does this work physiologically? Well, you know, the stent doesn't say, oh my god, Where's my clopidogrel this morning? I'm going to show that guy. I'm going to cause a heart attack. No, that isn't what happens. You know, we, our clotting systems walk around in a finely tuned balance. And you know, you get a little bit of a prothrombotic stimulus for whatever reason. You know, you've got an increased inflammatory cascade or volume depleted. Something bad, something that tells the body, make a little more clotting factors. Rev up the platelets a little more this morning. And boom, if you're not protected, the stent clots. So what happens? Well, there's a bit of a firestorm in 2006. Uh, people say, whoa, this is unconscionable. Well, 
people said that because this was, you know, the, these reports started to come in, and mostly the problem was that they were unexpected. And when something's unexpected, you generally react more vigorously than to well, you know, something said, well, we expected this. So the firestorm, a lot of studies get published quickly. Let me show you real quickly what happened. This is a patient who died after having a stent, come to, comes to autopsy. The stent is shown here. It's sectioned longitudinally. And what you can see uh, on the top, this is not the breakfast taco that Dr. Jones showed you, but uh, uh, yeah, I know, but I'm going to screw it up if I use it. So take a look on, on top. What you see is a clot inside that section of the vessel, and that clot occurs in areas of the stent struts that have not yet been covered by endothelial cells. Down on the bottom, you see a section lower in the stent. The struts are covered. There's endothelium there. The stent's protected. So this got a lot of attention. This has largely gotten us to where we are. 2006, a firestorm, special FDA hearings. The use of drug-eluting stents dropped from 95% to 75%. Took about two years to recover. Fast forward, we're now dealing with another generation of stents that are better tolerated. Take a look on your left. This is uh, in a rabbit model. This is from uh, Dr. Renu Vermani. What you can see is with the current generation of stents, endothelial cell coverage is much better. So they're better tolerated by the vessels. They heal better. And consequently, we have seen many fewer stent thromboses than we used to. 1% at the end of a year, and then probably 0.4% per year after that. Uncommon, but still an issue. So what do we do today? I, hell, I got two and a half minutes left. Let's talk about the easy stuff first. Uh, patients on, so the minority report. Patients on oral anticoagulants, AFib. Now you've got to put them on dual antiplatelet therapy. Well, that's three drugs. That's a little scary. And in fact, uh, fortunately, this group comprises only 7% of the stented population. It's 7% every time it's looked at. It hits that number exactly. There are two non-definitive trials. They both indicate that oral anticoagulation plus clopidogrel is the way to go without aspirin. Going to three drugs puts the bleeding rates well off into the stratosphere. Upcoming non-cardiac surgery. Surgeons always want you to stop the dual antiplatelet therapy. Fortunately, that's within a year, only about 5% of stented population. Well, the real answer is you wait six months. Surgeon says, well, I want to do it now. There's some negotiation. You've got to be good at negotiating this stuff. You wait six months. You stop the... Uh, clopidogrel or whichever P2Y12 antagonist you're using several days before the surgery. Surgeons always want you to wait two weeks. The biology says four days will do it. Start it up as quickly afterwards as the surgeon will let you. Bioabsorbable scaffolds, not very many of these around. With the current generation that we use, you need at least two to three years of DAPT because there are late thromboses that occur as these scaffolds dissolve. You won't see very many, but when you do see someone with this, keep them on dual antiplatelet therapy. What about the other 88%, the rest of the universe? That's where it gets really unclear. Uh, there are uh, a large number of small, underpowered, unblinded, and I would like to say misleading trials of highly selected patients with limited follow-up that show no advantage for an upfront strategy of prolonging DAPT beyond six months. Peter, do you want to press these buttons for me? OK. And as, as a result, some of these stents, particularly in Europe, have gotten approval for use with very short durations of DAPT. Then what happens? Then the Swedeheart registry from Sweden comes out. Every stent in Sweden is in this registry. And what did they do? Well, they did a couple of different analyses. They compared uh, three months of therapy with more than three months of therapy. And take a look. Big difference in, uh, in the rate of uh, 
death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. The difference is 45 events per 1,000 patients, year, 1000 patients years. If you then took the same population, compared six months of therapy or more with less than six months, there's still an important difference, 22 events per 1,000 patients. And then there's the DAPT study, the most rigorous of all the trials, uh, nearly 10,000 patients in this study. To be in this study, you got a year of dual antiplatelet therapy and were then randomized to aspirin alone or aspirin versus, or aspirin plus athenopyridine, followed for another 18 months. So it's really 30 months versus 12 months. So is there a benefit going beyond a year? And here's the answer. Yes, there is. Composite endpoint, but take a look. Bill's coming up here. I guess I'm out of time. I, I'll end with this slide, but let's talk about it. There's a benefit. And, you know, you can look at this and say, well, you know, there's a more than a 20% relative difference. There is. But look at it in absolute terms. There's an absolute 1.1% difference. So what does that mean? That means if someone comes off antiplatelet therapy, you're now going from a 4.5% uh, risk to a 5.5% risk. So yes, you're increasing the risk. Yes, you've got to weigh this against the bleeding risk, and I don't have time to go into bleeding risk calculation, but it's not a black and white answer. There are patients in whom you're going to be willing to take this risk. If you stop dual antiplatelet therapy, you are not automatically consigning a patient to dying or having an MI. You're, reducing, uh, you're increasing their risk by a small amount. Now, in some patients, that's tolerable. In younger, healthier patients who tolerate their antiplatelet drugs, that probably doesn't make sense. In older, more infirm patients who've got more comorbidities, it probably does make sense. So I, I think we'll stop this there. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Let's go.